Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Faye Hanley Brown. I'm a managing director at FSG. Um, and along with our friends at the Collective Impact, uh, at the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, we are the partners behind the Collective Impact Forum. And I am delighted to welcome you to our third day of the Collective Impact Forum um, today. And I hope you all, I actually live here in Seattle, so I hope you all have been able to enjoy our beautiful city. Um, hopefully many of you were able to take advantage of the dine arounds that I know we had last night. Anybody get some good food? In Seattle? Yeah, awesome. Um, and also, hopefully, you had a chance to have a couple of couple cups of strong coffee while you've been here. <laughs> Maybe take a stroll down to the Pike Place Market um, and checked out some of our local uh, vendors and markets. Um, hopefully, had a chance to take in the beautiful waterfront as well. Um, Seattle, of course, is famous for many kinds of water although the most famous kind, the rainy kind, we have not had this week, which has been fantastic. So a wonderful way to, to welcome you all to Seattle. Um, and you may have noticed that as the conference has gone on, our group has actually been growing. So I had the pleasure of welcoming a larger group uh, to the conference this morning. Um, and in a water metaphor, uh, I would say that we have essentially three rivers of attendees that are coming together today to create the Puget Sound of our conference right here in Seattle. Um, so on Monday, we started with our funders. Um, so funders that have been here since Monday, raise your hands. Let me see all of you in the room. Great to see you all. Um, and then yesterday afternoon, we were joined by our seasoned backbone leaders. I'm not going to say mature, don't worry. Our seasoned backbone leaders. So backbone leaders, you want to raise your hands out there in the audience? Great. Um, and then today, we have been joined uh, by community members uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So community members, raise your hand. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, and a round of applause indeed, because I must say, I mentioned that I live here in Seattle. I know how precious it is to have 75, 80 degree weather with no rain in early June. So it is a huge sacrifice to have our community members here with us in a windowless conference room on a day like today. So thank you guys for being here. We're really delighted that you can join us. Um, so who's in the room today? Bring up the slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we have diverse group um, in terms of different roles that you all are playing in collective impact. Uh, we have over 50 community members, we have over 100 seasoned backbone leaders, and we have over 200 funders in the room today. And I know that many of you are in fact wearing multiple hats, right? You might be a community member and a funder and a backbone, and I'm sure that's true for many of you in the room. But to stick with the metaphor of our three rivers coming together into the Puget Sound of this conference, uh, it's worth mentioning that the Puget Sound here um, in the Seattle area is not only a breathtakingly beautiful body of water, which it is, and hopefully you all have um, been able to take that in, but it is also incredibly biologically diverse. In fact, it has the most biologic di biological diversity of any of the bodies of water in Washington state, and it's also incredibly productive. So the Puget Sound and the rivers that flow into it actually produce the most salmon uh, in Washington state than anywhere else, and hopefully you guys have been able to take advantage of that productivity. Um, but nature is a great teacher, right? Diversity and productivity go hand in hand. And I would say that the same is true for collective impact, right? The more diverse perspectives that you bring to your work, the more deeply you can understand the problems that you're trying to address and what's working and what's not working in your community. The faster you can learn and actually make progress together. So as you get to the heart of collective impact, really what we're trying to do is bring all those diverse perspectives together, right? The funders, the nonprofits, the companies and employers, the government, community members, and perhaps most importantly, the community members that most deeply experience the issues that we're trying to address. 
bringing all of these different perspectives is critical because each of these perspectives is critical to solving the problem, but none of those actors can solve the problem alone, right? So this is the heart of collective impact, is to bring these people together in a structured way to get to the collective seeing, the collective learning, and the collective doing that gets us to impact at scale, which is ultimately why we are doing this work. So it's no accident that we have funders, community members, backbone leaders together in the same room. And I think it's a real opportunity for you all Really focus on that today in your conversations with folks at your tables, in the breakouts, in the hallway. Focus on those different perspectives and the opportunity to learn from one another about this work. Um, we're really excited to have you all together for uh, this third day of the conference. So, um, as Sherry Brady mentioned on our opening uh, session on Monday, not only do we have diverse perspectives in terms of different roles that folks are playing in collective impact, we also have a lot of different perspectives in terms of the issues that you all are tackling every day. So this just gives you a sense of um, the different issue areas that the groups are working on. And as you can see, more than half, 67%, are focused on education and youth. We have many working on health and nutrition, um, community development. There's a whole range there. And it's important to note that, of course, many of you are working on multiple issues at once because these issues are all twined together in the communities in which we live. It's also worth noting that we're all in different places in terms of our experience with collective impact and collaborative work. So uh, the majority of folks are in the middle years, are implementing collective impact, right, in the process of implementing. We also have several that are at the more early stages. Um, so we've got about 21% that are early, another 6% that are really just exploring, thinking about collective impact. Is this relevant for us, for our, for our community? And then we have our collective impact experts, the 17% or so of you that are well into implementation and are really at the mature phases of your collaboratives. So again, just an enormous wealth of knowledge just here sitting in the room with all of you. And then for those of us that are just joining us today, um, I've been asked to remind you about our fabulous conference app. Um, this is a free app that you should be able to access very easily. Um, you want to just put in your password, uh, your username, which is your email, and the password, which is CIF2016. And this is a great opportunity for you to be able to track what's going on in the conference, but also importantly, to connect with one another. So all of our attendees and panelists are also listed on the app. It's a great way to connect um, with others that are here. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that. So housekeeping out of the way, um, whoops. I'm excited to bring us into our first uh, plenary discussion today, and I'm really excited about it. Um, we have multiple perspectives in this room, and so what we'd like to start with today is actually the perspectives of the backbone and funder. Um, together. So we actually have two Backbone Funder pairs that I'm going to ask now to come up to the stage and join us. Um, one from here in Seattle and then one from the Rio Grande um, Valley in Texas. Um, and as we do this, we're going to do a bit of a transition. So they're going to take the podium away. I'm going to come um, and sit down with our panelists and we'll transition over to the panel. Is this on? Great. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, I know that we um, talk a lot often about the different roles in collective impact. Um, and funders and backbone organizations play such critical roles in this work. Uh, funders can be catalysts. They can be conveners. They can be capacity builders. Uh, funders can spotlight the problem and create urgency in a way that few others can. And they can also encourage organizations and people to work together in different ways. So they play critical roles in collective impact. And of course, backbone leaders and backbone staff really provide the capacity to move the whole collective impact effort forward, right? Backbone organizations play a wide range of roles, which I know we'll hear about today, but just in terms of keeping everyone focused on the shared goals and the shared vision for the work, 
um, helping organizations to more clearly align their work with one another, um, helping to collect data around those shared measures and actually sense make from that. What does it mean? Um, helping uh, to mobilize funding for the effort, importantly, helping to engage the broader community in the work. There is a long list of roles that backbone players um, play, and I think Chief Cat Herder is probably somewhere on that list, right? It's a, it's a really complex role. Um, so I am just delighted to uh, welcome our panelists to the stage today. They are four of the leaders in the collective impact field that I admire the most. Um, really exciting to have these folks on stage today, and I will just briefly introduce them. Um, next to me, we have Wynn Rosser, who's the president and CEO of the Greater Texas Foundation. Um, Greater Texas Foundation is a statewide foundation that's focused on um, education and is specifically post-secondary attainment in Texas. Um, next to Wynn, we have Dr. Lucelma Canales, um, who is the head of RGV Focus. Um, RGV Focus is the backbone organization for an effort in the Rio Grande Valley um, in Texas that is focused on post-secondary uh, attainment. Uh, next to uh, Lucelma, we have David Bly, who is the director of the Pacific Northwest Initiative at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And David really heads up all of the Gates Foundation's work in this region. And then finally, last but not least, we have Mary Jean Ryan, um, who is the executive director of Community Center for Education Results. Um, CCER is the backbone organization for a local uh, education reform effort, Cradle to College and Career Education Reform effort here in South Seattle, South King County, called the Roadmap Project, um, which some of you may have been hearing quite a bit about over the last couple of days. So just delighted to welcome you all to the stage. Um, and perhaps before we jump into sort of the meat of the conversation, it would be great just to set some context for everybody in the room about the two great efforts that you all are involved in. Um, so perhaps uh, Lucelma, Mary Jean, I might ask you just to provide a, a two minute overview of the work that you're doing um, in Texas and here in Seattle. Sure, um, so we talk about the Rio Grande Valley like most of you know where the Rio Grande Valley is, right? So that if you can imagine that the tip of Texas is right on the bottom, we represent the four southernmost uh, counties on the Mexico-Texas uh, Texas border. Um, those four counties represent about 1.3 million individuals, of which 35% of those families live uh, below the poverty line. Um, we also have 38% of the adults over the age of 25 without a high school diploma or GED. Um, it, that area was known for agriculture, and in the late 1980s, we lost a lot of that, and it became to transform itself in different ways. One thing that the Rio Grande Valley is known for is for its innovative practices and partnerships. And when I talk about that, I talk about really authentic and meaningful partnerships. Uh, we're 97% Hispanic of Mexican American descent. Uh, we're, like I said, right along the border. Uh, because of the authentic partnerships that we already had and great partners like Wynn and Educate Texas, who is who the backbone is for this work, um, we were really positioned to do collective impact. Um, and so we focused on, in 2012, focused on finding out what folks wanted to, to focus on. And so for us, it's all kids getting college ready, going to college, completing a degree, and entering uh, a job with labor market payoffs. And so we're really excited. We've just published our second annual report. And even with, and maybe because of our demographics, we actually, as as a community outperformed the state of Texas in seven of our nine outcomes. Um, and when we, compare, <laughs> when we compare Latino students in the Rio Grande Valley to Latino students in Texas, we outperform in many of our outcomes with as much as, as double digits. And so we asked the state of Texas and we asked the rest of the country to look south if you want to learn about how to better support Latino students and how to work collaboratively authentically to move the needle in big ways. Thank you, Lucama. Mary Jean. Great, um, it's a real honor to be here today. And before I uh, say a little bit about the Roadmap Project, I just wanna um, say thanks to FSG uh, for all the work that they've done over the years to really elevate and help us all understand this whole crazy idea of collective impact. Um, 
early in the, in the formation of the roadmap project, FSG helped us and Faye um, in particular and a couple of her other colleagues. So thank you, because we never would have gotten the roadmap project going without um, FSG's help. Um, when we started, which was in 2010, and you'll hear more from David, um, who was definitely, along with some other folks, um, co-creator, um, the term collective impact hadn't been, you know, coined yet. That famous article came out in 2011. So um, in 2010, without knowing it, we had created a backbone organization, and then a couple months later, without knowing it, we had launched a collective impact initiative. So. You can imagine my relief when I actually read that article. Um, I, I, I cried. I, I was moved by it. I, I thought, my God, I, you know, I'm not um, insane. Um, uh, it, it is uh, a lot of people around the world, actually, are um, seeing this approach as a, a very powerful way to work on the big problems of our time. Um, so um, we started Roadmap in 2010. Um, the big goal for us is uh, doubling the number of young people from our region who are able to uh, get a college degree or a career credential um, uh, by 2020 and to close our race and ethnic achievement and opportunity gaps. Um, we're a cradle through college uh, and career project. We took a lot of inspiration from Strive from Cincinnati. We still work very closely with the Strive National Network and find their help um, invaluable. Um, since, we, since starting, we've built up really great data capabilities um, that allow us to report on our indicators of student success um, and hopefully bring data to the tables um, of people who are trying to do this work. Um, we've supported a ton of different uh, planning efforts, many campaigns, uh, and we've seen really good signs of progress across the continuum. Um, a lot of great work is happening right now, building a youth re-engagement system. We're part of the Opportunity Youth Initiative across the country, doing a lot of work um, in summer reading, a lot of work on college uh, readiness. And um, we're really um, buoyed by the progress, but I will say uh, we're not satisfied. And we're doing a lot of planning now, really looking at all the fundamentals of our project um, to try to set ourselves up to be able to accelerate project progress, especially um, when it comes to closing gaps, um, uh, race and ethnic gaps. This region, I'm, I'm you know, obviously from Seattle, um, uh, and I'm really happy to have you guys all here. It is a place of tremendous uh, contrasts. And so like the core reason we started this project was that we are this incredible, productive knowledge economy and we're not doing a good job of educating the kids growing up in our region uh, to take advantage of these great opportunities. Uh, we, have, we work with in South Seattle and South King County, um, and it may surprise you, but 70% of the young people from, and we work in seven school districts, are um, non-white students, 60% free and reduced price lunch, 40% of the kindergartners are English language learners. Um, we're a place that's been written about uh, as a, as a uh, kind of poster child of the suburbanization of poverty in the United States. So we're full of challenges and um, believe um, to our core that the collective impact approach is absolutely the way to go. But you've got to be persistent and maybe it's obvious. It's certainly not for the weak of heart. That's for sure. Thank you, Mary Jean and Luselma. And really helpful to provide some of the context about the great work that you all are doing. Um, and I think so important to recognize the fact that even though you are both working on education-related issues, the context in which you are working is really quite different, right? Mary Jean talks about just the incredible um, div racial and economic diversity we have here in South Seattle, South King County. The Rio Grande Valley is, what did you say, 97%? Our, di um, yeah. our yeah. diversity is another it's way. It's a different kind of diversity, <laughs> right? It's still yeah. diverse, but a different yeah. kind of diversity. Yeah. And so I think just really um, rem remembering how important context is in this work, even if you are working on the same issues, place matters so deeply mm -hmm. um, in this work. So really helpful to, to set the context. Um, so you all are experienced practitioners. You are well into the mature stages of collective impact and already beginning to see results. So exciting to hear that. 
Um, I would love, therefore, to spend some of our time together t really diving into some of the, the more difficult issues in collective impact, and by that I mean issues of accountability, <laughs> issues of sustainability, um, issues of control, because I think these are some of the really tricky issues that will come up in the very earliest stages of collective impact, but that you all will be wrestling with as you move through on your um, collective impact journey. Um, so before we dive into that, though, I would love to actually start with the relationships that each of you have. So that funder backbone relationship, which is such a critical one uh, in collective impact. And so um, without acting as a couples therapist, that's not <laughs> what I'm trying to do here. Um, I, I guess I'd just love to hear from each of you about your relationship in terms of the funder backbone relationship. And specifically, how is this a different relationship from the traditional funder grantee relationship that perhaps many of us in the room are more used to? Because it is, it's a, it's a very different different way of, of interacting. I just wanna, I don't know who wants to take that one first. I think one of the other differences uh, for us, uh, the two examples you have in front of you is, I'm a local funder in RGB Focus and I'm 500 miles away. <laughs> um, it's about an eight hour drive from Bryan College Station, Texas to the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and so uh, one of the things we've chosen to do as a foundation is go to areas of the state where there's not someone like us. And it, uh, so Lucelma and I have known each other since 2008 or 9, something like that. Our relationship predates RGB Focus. Um, and so uh, we have a, a friendship um, that probably first a, uh, we're like-minded and uh, co-conspirators. <laughs> and uh, we deeply believe in this work that Lucelma is leading and deeply believe in the place, the Rio Grande Valley. And so um, I think, you know, when you talk about building trust, well, Lucelma and I already had trust. Um, Educate Texas, the organization that houses the backbone, is uh, one of our closest partners statewide. And so we already had trust and a depth of relationship there. Um, what, what we've been able to do, though, through the trust that we already had is um, I get the benefit of Lucelma trusting me with all of the other community partners in the Rio Grande Valley who may have known who I was, may have heard of our organization, but didn't know us and didn't trust us themselves. And so I think um, you know, how, how we uh, share trust and how we help build trust is really important, and it's especially different when um, I don't drive through uh, the neighborhoods that we're focused on or the school districts that we're focused on uh, to get to work every day. Um, I'm a visitor, and I, uh, I take the, the privilege of being able to visit the Rio Grande Valley very seriously um, whenever I'm uh, blessed to go down and learn from the leaders like Danny King at Far San Juan Alamo School District that we were talking about this morning and the work they're doing that really is transformative. And I think for, for us as a partner, um, we've always, and I think this is why we get along so well, is that we're thought partners. And so we really, I think, as the Rio Grande Valley have adopted Wynn <laughs> and others like him, that come not with solutions, but come with, with really big questions that really push us to go beyond. And so when we talk about issues, we really are talking about how do we co-construct things. It's not about, hey, look, here's what's going on over here. Come adopt this or do that. I mean, this really started in 2011 while I was still at the community college. And when an Educate Texas came to us and said, there's this thing called collective impact. They sent us this article about two weeks before they came down. They said, let's come meet with the community college. And for South Texas College at that time, I remember to have the courage to say, STC cannot be the backbone for this. And this is why. You know, it'll become a com another community college initiative. And to be able to have that kind of honest and raw conversation and really say who is prepared to do this, mm -hmm. you know, and what will the, will the Rio Grande Valley benefit from? And so I can call Wynn or Leslie or Carol or anyone on the team and really think through some issues or, and like I said, Wynn really pushes us. Uh, we are positive disrupt disruptors, I think, and that's why I think we all get along. But the Rio Grande Valley is one of five regions in Texas that if we don't take care of I increasing educational attainment, uh, the state of Texas will not improve. When you look at the coordinating board and the closing the gaps, had it not been for the Rio Grande Valley, the coordinating board would not have closed the gaps in Latino, at least enrollments and other things. We were the only region in the state that really moved substantially. And so the Rio Grande Valley is really important to Texas. And through collective impact, I think, we embrace the, the, the form 
of collective impact because of folks like Wynn and, and others that said, let us come and help kind of think through what would we, if we blueprint this in a different way, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. And there was already a lot of work happening. So I think for funders like Wynn and, and others to come to the table and say, we honor the work that's been happening, let's lift it and shine a light on it, and let's really think about how do we go bigger and wider? You know, and I remember one superintendent saying um, that the way that we will know that we're successful is when, for example, the superintendent of McAllen cares more about the kids in Progreso and how they're doing as much as they care about their own. Mm -hmm. And um, so for us, I think the relationship is one of thought partnership, of being really honest and really pushing the pushing the needle, I, I mean, pushing us in ways that, that we've never pushed ourselves in. Yeah, no, I think, and clearly that relationship, it starts with the, with the relationship, which mm -hmm. I think where, where you started when, and then the opportunity to sort of co-construct or co-create this, mm -hmm. which is perhaps quite different from a traditional um, funder-grantee relationship where it, it might be more one, one way in some cases. And David, I know you've talked a lot about co-creation in this work. Yeah. Um, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about your philosophy coming into this and sort of the sort of creation story of the roadmap, if you will, and, and, and how you address that as a sure, funder. Sure, let me offer just a few different reflections. One is just a pure funder lens. Yep. Two is this issue of trust, and three is some of the unique historical context here. Mm -hmm. In terms of the funder context, I mean, philanthropy is, is such a variety of practices and philosophies that I don't think this approach is necessarily the right one for every problem, nor is it going to be possible for certain funders who don't come with the right mindset to begin with. And so I think what these kinds of problems require is this commitment, as you said in your opening, to accelerate really large scale improvement and impact. If that's not what you're about, then this is probably too complicated an approach. Um, but if that is what you hold in common with your community, then, um, I would say that there are certain preconditions that the funder has to hold itself. One is that uh, you, if you are a control freak, you will fail at this <laughs> quite seriously. It just won't work. And we fight that tendency all the time at the Gates Foundation. So this is very dissimilar to much of what else goes on in the Gates culture. Two is, and you referenced this, uh, Faye, if you don't go in here knowing what you, that there's a lot you don't know, if you're not about the learning and the course correction, then you'll have no impact. Um, you might spend a lot of money, and you might <laughs> think you're effective, but you won't be. And then finally is this question of values. That is, as you're going about making big time change against intractable problems, you think of Newton's first law, which is um, an object at rest stays at rest until something moves it. Um, well, part of that requires real clarity about what impact and improvement looks like, the what and the how, and what success looks like. And on the social problems that Mary Jean are working on together, um, which is around uh, opportunity, it's about pathways out of poverty through educational attainment, and you look at the data and your own moral philosophy, and you see the correlation between the problem and issues of race, income, and gender. Again, if you don't have the values right going in as a funder, you're just going to get totally uh, beat up, basically, because you've got to be really clear. <laughs> In terms of the historical context, um, the comparative advantage that we had here in Seattle, other than Faye and some really great people on my team, like Ken Thompson, who I know was on a panel earlier, um, so talent matters. Um, but the real advantage that I believe we had is I had worked with Mary Jean together for Mayor Rice in the early 1990s. So our professional and personal relationship goes back literally, literally decades on these issues. And while we've kind of come and gone in each other's lives over time, none of us, I think, can claim credit for what has been built, meaning there was this odd convergence six years ago where just several of us were all thinking the same thing. And I was locked in a room with Ken from the Gates Foundation saying, well, what are the implications for how we do our work, not knowing that Mary Jean was locked in other rooms with other people. <laughs> And so when we finally came together, we did not have to spend what would normally, in my opinion, take anywhere from two to five years to build trust, because trust, in my mind, is based on two things, that you feel the other side is capable of doing whatever it is they need to do, and you're confident that they will deliver on it. So um, if you don't feel they're capable and dependable, it takes years of working together. That's the only way you build it. We were able to shortcut that to a large extent. As the circle has grown, we're all meeting people we've never worked with before, so actually it begins to slow down again. 
and you get into long periods where the trust building is actually the main, main thing. So that's just a quick reflection. Um, just to be careful that you're attacking the problem with the right tool, in this case, collective impact, that you come with the right mindset as a funder because it's not your typical mindset. And thirdly, this trust thing that you mentioned is really important and you can't shortcut it. So if you're lucky, you've already been doing the work, you just never called it collective impact till now. <laughs> Which I think is the case for many people, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and I so appreciate you guys drawing out this, these sort of key components of the funder backbone relationship, because I think they really are important to success. And as we look at collective impact efforts that are really successful, you see this pattern of deep relationships and trust. And also, as you say, David, that funder mindset, mm -hmm. coming into it with the right, the right funder mindset. Um, one of the questions that, uh, that we get a lot in this work, um, because collect one of the hallmarks of collective impact is structure, right? You've got a backbone that has dedicated staff, you have a steering committee, you have working groups. There's lots of structural aspects to collective impact, which perhaps distinguish it from, from collaboration. But I think that because that structure exists, it can lead to misconceptions about who makes decisions and who has control. Um, is it the backbone? The backbone's in charge, or the steering committee's in charge, or the funders are in charge, or the community at large is in charge. So mm -hmm. I think that some of these questions about who has control in a collective impact effort um, can be really tricky because this is such a different way of doing work. And I'd love for you guys to, to address this a little bit. Um, you know, David, you mentioned sort of starting with a smaller group, um, you and Mary Jean in the beginning, but it went quite quickly to a much larger group and to the broader community. How do you all think about the issues of control in collective impact? And Mary Jean, do you want to start us off here? <laughs> sure, Mary Jean. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an easy one. Well, um, when, I, when I knew that we were going to be asked to address the question of control, I laughed <laughs> because um, we'd, we have no formal authority <laughs> over anything. And <laughs> um, I've been kind of amazed at how, I, mean, may, I don't know, maybe this sounds weird to say, but how people pay attention to leadership, I guess. It, it, it's the fundamental of it, um, that you have the ability as leaders in your community, if you band together, to amass a fair amount of influence. So I think it's, it's much more a question of um, influence and what you decide to do with that influence um, versus this idea of control. Um, you know, I, back to the other question about funders, I, I um, once was reflecting on this and I thought to myself, they, they give up what I think is the illusion of control. But you give that up and you gain what I would say is a possibility of, imp of large scale impact. It's not a certainty, but it is a possibility. And then by the way you work, you up the odds of getting to that impact. Um, I do think it's really complicated and, and full of, um, of peril that the perceptions, and we've, you know, we've certainly, um, uh, had to work through, and, and, and I'm sure it will be something we'll, we'll continue to wrestle with, that people um, it, it can perceive that you have all this power and control and can perceive that they themselves do not. And often, you know, the, the communities themselves have a tremendous amount of power um, and, and perhaps are not... Um, as self-aware of the amount of power that they have. Um, so, um, I mean, I think a lot about this whole um, business as, a, uh, as an enterprise for um, uh, changing the status quo. And I think if people, again, aren't ready for, you know, the, the rough seas, um, I mean, then don't get into this. But you're, you wouldn't do collective impact, you wouldn't do it if the uh, issue that you were working on uh, was, you know, if it was all happy time, you're doing it because the status quo is not producing the impacts that you want. So by definition, you're in, a, you know, some of the biggest political battles mm -hmm. of our time. And it's, uh, to me, again, it's about how we organize um, together 
um, to push that status quo and, and knock it down. So I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense. No, and I think this is um, actually a really critical theme that we have been following over the last few days of this conference, in fact. The idea of, you know, sort of who has power and the need to upend the status quo and to share power and to give some power up in order to really get to the change that we need in our communities. Um, Usama and Wynn, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how this is playing out in, in the RGV. Can so, you speak to this? So, so in the RGV, if you can imagine, I drive about a thousand miles a week and those are not like highway miles, right? And so I represent about 4,316 square miles, 39 school districts, um, a regional service center, four higher eds, and in the, in, it used to be five higher eds. We did away with two, created one un new university. So uh, we have had major, major transitions, right? And so when I was hired, uh, Chris, my boss, says to me, okay, part of your job description is to do leadership development of these CEOs. And I'm like, what? <laughs> How do I tell CEOs what to do, right? And it has to be done really by modeling. And so I don't see us as having control. And as, and Wynn has known me for a long time, and many people have known me for a long time, I'm a practitioner that rolls up her sleeves and is deep in the work. So imagine how hard it is for someone like me to slow down and say, whoa, I have no control. Uh, but I do have the ability to influence. Before I am born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, I was a migrant farm worker. I know the plight of our families. Um, I'm the first in my family. My dad came over as a bracero. Uh, with a third grade education. So I represent my people. And I, rep and I, for 32 years, spent time, you know, building those relationships. And so when I was hired, then I made the move from higher ed to, to this world. I already had retired. trust. <laughs> retired, <laughs> yeah, from the I retired, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, with 85% of the CEOs. And I'm not just talking about superficial trust. I met a superintendent in a parking lot and I said, you had 24 hours to tell me if we can build this early college high school because I had to withdraw from another partner. And in 24 hours, we created an early college high school, a dropout prevention and recovery program. And that's the deep work that we had done. And so I, I don't know that it's control or anything else, uh, but I will tell you my leadership team includes 11 of the 39 superintendents, uh, all, all four higher ed presidents, the two workforce boards, the United Way, Equal Voice, La Unión del Pueblo Intero, and we're getting ready to shake things up again. I really do think it's not about control, it's about um, building the muscle within our leaders to think about doing work differently. Um, and it's a really interesting way of doing business because meetings don't look like they traditionally look. Uh, we're not presenting, we're not giving updates. We literally have these CEOs engaging in hard questions. And, um, and, and, and so when we think, it, planning for our meetings takes, okay, for our three hour meetings, planning for them takes a week or two. Because you have to be that thoughtful. And we talk about, re, you know, starting with results. We have to know what we're trying to, to get at. And think about losing control. In the middle of a meeting, the meeting can shift immediately with my co-chair where we're whispering and it's like holy mother we've got to move this thing around <laughs> right and that's literally how you're doing it and so you have no control and you have to be okay with having no control um so when i don't know if you would agree he's on my leadership team also <laughs> i think the uh what david said at first i like the word influence that mary jean used mm -hmm. and what david said specifically about funders and you know we have our strategies and we have our priorities and we have our way of doing things and we expect anyone that comes to get our money to do things the way we want them done and we get our quarterly or more frequent reporting um, and you know it's, it's really about other people running our play and in this work it's a different mindset mm -hmm. your opportunity for that kind of control is when you make that initial deci decision and you immediately then give up control and if you have the, this illusion of control that Mary Jean mentioned, you'll spend a lot of time frustrated. And you're gonna frustrate community members and you're gonna tear apart that trust. Because mm -hmm. what you're committing to is a process where local leaders use local data to make decisions about local priorities 
and things that are important to that community. Um, and if you buy into this rigorous process where the leaders are making those decisions, again, that are important locally, that's, that's that mind shift, mindset shift. And, you know, I have then, so where does, so what, why am I in this? Well, Lucilla, Lucilla mentioned the, the five big regions of the state. 80% of our students stay local for, 70% uh, stay local for higher education. 80% of our population lives in these five big regions. We're focused on population, population level change, like I think Michael said yesterday. Um, I get to influence a region that has almost 400,000 K-12 students and almost 100,000 higher ed students. And they're the students that we, among those that we care the most about. And so it's about being at a table with transform transformational leaders. And I initially thought, well, I'm going to have to be the one that asks the hard questions. And Lucilla <laughs> gave me credit for that. The leaders are asking the hard questions themselves. In the Valley, unlike many places in our country, you can't drive around poverty. You see it. So if you're a leader in these communities, who uh, most of whom are from the communities, like Lucelma, you understand the situation much better than someone coming in from uh, who has some state-level data points to bring to the conversation. I thought, well, I'll be the one that has to have those really difficult conversations and be the one that asks those really difficult questions. No, I don't. Actually, I'm the encourager and the cheerleader sometimes when those local leaders beat themselves up for not making as much progress as they think they should have. I'm the one that, that congratulates them for doing things very differently and helping them understand, helping them place their work, this regional work in the state and national context based on what I see in other places. And so I think, um, you know, the, the role of influencer and control exists at different levels. And so there's the control that you think you have as a funder relative to the larger landscape that where you exist. Um, and then um, there's trying to control something that you really can't. So I think this herding cats analogy is a really good one. And then there's this role of influence, which is incredibly important and powerful if we'll think about the way we work with communities um, and those who are already influencers in the communities that we're interested in. So can I add a Go few ahead. things? Yeah, yeah cause I want to stay here because I think that the issue of governance, influence, and or power um, might be the single biggest issue we still haven't come to terms with in our work here. And um, I don't disagree with the aspirational aspects of what we're describing we're trying to build. I question whether it exists at least at many of the tables I sit at here. Um, because when you, um, it's one thing to say that everybody comes to the table with an equal voice, even when you are highly inclusive in who you invite. But the reality is once you get to the table, in the absence of written rules um, or, or well-accepted norms, what you default to is people's perceptions of power and influence, even though the people who have the perceived power may be thinking they're acting in a different way. At the end of the day, it's the funder that still writes the check. It's the government that still has the legal authority and responsibility and organizational capacity to do things. And it's literally everybody else from the community, from formal and informal organizations that most often have no legal authority, little political influence, little organizational capacity. They often don't have access to data or knowledge to even participate as fully as they need to in the solution setting. So I say it's more. Uh, aspiration than real because I what I'm saying here I think is we are not in a perfect place yet and so issues of governance power and influence it is around the mindset and your behavior to follow your values mm -hmm. but at the end of the day if certain segments of the community don't have these capacities mm -hmm. at the end of the day you'll revert back to the norm which is to a system that actually is inequitable and part and big change is really hard mm -hmm. because if it just got down to governments and deep-pocketed funders saying, let's just do the right thing, we would have done the right thing by now. There's bigger forces at play here. And I don't have a lot of answers to this, but I believe one of the answers is, in addition to being equitable in your outlook and your invitations, is building the capacity for others to actually have influence. So that's what yeah. I would say. No, and I, I think that that's so critical, right, David? Because I think that there is in many communities that gap between the aspiration mm -hmm. for um, equal participation and equal voice, including most importantly from community members themselves, and yet the reality is so very different from that. And that requires, you know, I think as we've been discussing, significant mindset shifts and significant changes in the way that people do work. But I would also posit that that is an important role for funders and backbones, right? To create the space and the mechanisms and perhaps the unwritten rules and norms to allow for that shift. And that's not, that is not easy work. <laughs> so wait, can I, can I add? Yeah. Because one of the concerns that I have is that we all have a different definition of what engagement means yeah. and what voice means. Yeah. 
And we talk a lot in the Valley that we're not about doing four or two, right? And so if a real big mind, uh, a shift for us is we do with. So that doesn't mean that everybody has an invitation to your table. It means that sometimes you have to crash a party and you've got to go to where people are and really understand what issues people have. In the Rio Grande Valley, I don't know how many of you know what colonias are, but they're underdeveloped, under-resourced communities, many of which don't even have infrastructure like roads and you know, sewer systems. We've got about 250 of those in the Rio Grande Valley. And they, th we have some of the strongest advocates mm -hmm. and folks on the ground doing work, grassroots for themselves. We have PTA comunitarios that are not PTA fundraisers. They literally are dealing with issues. And you're talking about mothers that have less than a fifth grade education in the native language. And so it's really arrogant of us, I think, in many ways to think that we can just, you know, uh, build the space for voice. And for us, it's actually we're flipping the table and we're saying, invite us to your table. Let us help you build the capacity to advocate in a different way. A good example for us is the state of Texas implemented House Bill 5 under the 83rd legislature, and they included all those new requirements. Believe it or not, even undereducated parents understand what change means for their kids. So we actually partnered with the Equal Voice Network in Arise, and they wanted to survey parents, and I said to them, well, if there, this is a, these are community organizers, yeah. Yeah. formerly at, at great odds with the, the educational institutions, right. yeah. and now they sit at the leadership table. And so when we went to them and we said, you know, if you're going to do a survey, the first thing you need to be careful with is that the superintendents are not going to believe your survey if you're asking leading questions. Mm -hmm. So let us help you build capacity to do a real survey that's going to be accepted. So we assigned a team member to work with them. Come going back and forth, because remember, we think we're researchers. These are folks that I really have no background in research. And so we helped them with the survey. We brought them in front of our leadership team table and said, okay, go over the survey with them. Mm -hmm. Got feedback from the superintendents, even got them to open their doors. In two weeks, these organizers obtained 1,800 surveys, door to door. 99% of the parents gave their name and phone number to them. We gave up half of the time of one of our leadership team meetings uh, to do a mesa comunitaria. And notice my language, it's not our language. We're not doing a community round table, we're doing a mesa comunitaria that was co-led. All we did was create the space, we, you know, spent some money on lunch, uh, but we had our leaders come to their table. And what we found was 88% of families in the colonias do not, under, do not understand the House Bill 5 endorsements. They don't understand their graduation plans. An aha moment for all of us was all of these parents understood that they were really concerned that math didn't have a role in, in all but one of the endorsements. A shocker for the superintendents to hear that undereducated families understood the role of math. So all of that to say we had no control over the data, mm -hmm. no control over the collection or analysis of it, but we created the space for authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. And now you've got superintendents with action commitments to work with these community organizers that have been at odds for decades. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning to see, you know, so we had, I think we have to challenge ourselves on, and our mental models of what we think what engagement means and what lending voice means. Thank you so much for that specific example, Lisa. I think it's really, really helpful to sort of put, make this more tangible, right? What, how does the work need to shift um, to get to that? And I'm going to put a pin in the conversation at this point because I know the panel this afternoon is about power dynamics and collective impact and community voice, and this is so important. And so I know we'll be continuing that conversation this afternoon. Um, Wynn wanted to get one more comment. Sure, I, I, so I, 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 <laughs> I hear the word community a lot. I think yeah. we need to ask ourselves, what do we mean by community? Uh, 39 municipalities, hundreds of thousands of, well, thousands of people in Texas in this four county region living in these unincorporated communities. Mm -hmm. um, people that don't live uh, in town who get their mail one place, they shop for groceries in another, uh, their kids go to school in another. What's their community? I think most of this language is urban language. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of us that are interested in areas that are urban and rural mixed, I think we really need to be, be thoughtful about how we use the word community and how we invite the community to the table when you've got 1.2 million, 1.3 million residents. Well, who speaks for the community? And I think it makes some of these strategies where um, 
the backbones and the leaders are out in, in the quote unquote of community uh, really powerful, important. So mm -hmm. everyone can't sit at the leadership table, but how right. do you make sure that the leadership table is- The mechanisms is, yeah. for, for mm -hmm. that voice, absolutely. So um, I had one, because we have funders and backbones on the stage, I can't, I have to ask this last question before we turn it back to you guys as the audience. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask you all, this is long-term work, right? This is work that is about systems change that has population level outcomes. This is work that is decades long, right? This is, this is long-term work. Um, and I, I think it was William Bell at the Casey Family Programs that said, life cycle change does not happen on a grant cycle timeline, right? And this is one of the big issues that we hear so much in this work is sustainability, funding, how do you actually keep this work going over the long term, particularly when this work is much longer than a typical grant or funder timeline, whether it be public or private. And I'd love for you guys to address this. Again, you all are several years into this work. Um, you as funders, um, Wynn and David, are deeply involved but you also have boards and others that you have to manage. How, can you speak to this issue of sustainability and funding and, and collective impact, given how long-term it is? Well, I can start. <laughs> David, um, start us. Yeah, and again, it depends on what kind of funding organization you work in. So at mm -hmm. the Gates Foundation, um, we're just a little rounding error, my team, and what we're talking about here, they're up doing things like eradicating polio. So when you think about polio, we may actually eradicate it next year, but if you think about this, it was 1954 when we actually had the solution, so it's 60 years of work. So I'm lucky to come from a foundation that has a long-term mindset that we, by design, go up against really hard problems, and we know that a three-year grant cycle will not solve the problem. So having said that, that's lucky. On the other hand, you don't want to invest in things uh, in perpetuity if, in fact, you're not convinced you're making progress. So that's the tension. So as Mary Jean and I tried to conceive of the relationship, we had an unspoken, well, we had a spoken understanding, but it was not in a grant that it would take at least 10 years for this to make any difference at all. It would probably take three to five years just to build this infrastructure and capacity before we saw any real movement for kids. So we had that understanding going in, but we still have our three, four, or five year grant cycles. And just the last point I'd make is I happened to be in a discussion on this yesterday with our leadership, and um, I'm pushing for us to think in 10-year increments going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because um, I was being challenged by people who said, well, why would you say 10 years when it's really going to at least take 20 or 30? Maybe we should be thinking in 20-year increments. Don't get too excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll both be dead I'll by be then. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, we, I think we actually have come to, to terms with that, but the question is what kind of progress metrics can you have so that either you can course correct or abandon it if it's not working? Yeah, yeah, and that's an important tension to hold, right. absolutely. Yeah. Wynn, do you want to weigh in on what that looks like for you all? So we're, uh, again, we're, you know, we're not in uh, the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, we care about uh, the entire state of Texas, and there are other regions of the state where there's not someone like us. And so uh, our board is interested in us know, taking what we've learned in the Rio Grande Valley and moving to other regions of the state. And in fact, we just made a, a, a grant to, to educate Texas to start a collective impact uh, initiative in El Paso. Um, and so um, we're starting to think about what do we do in El Paso. And then there's another region after that in our list of priority regions. Um, and so I, I think about sustainability in a couple of different ways. I'm, like, like David just indicated, I, I think this is decades of work and I personally am not ready to, to walk away from the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, so I, I want us to figure out a way to stay connected and involved. There's tremendous learning, um, and um, the work has started. It's not done. Um, but I, I think about sustainability also in, in terms of uh, these large public systems. Again, 39 school districts, almost 400,000 kids, uh, almost 100,000 higher ed uh, students in four different institutions. Um, so we invest a few hundred thousand dollars a year um, over some period of time, what better ROI is there to, than to ensure those large public systems are getting the results we hope they get for the kids that we care about? Um, and so is there a better sustainability strategy than investing in those large public systems and in superintendents and college leaders and in community-based organizations, uh, economic development corporations that care deeply about this region? Uh, it's their home. They want it to be transformed. They are transforming it. Um, and so uh, there may not be a better sustainability play than, than, in, than leveraging those public dollars in a, in a really smart way. So I'm, I'm trying to think about it in a couple of different ways. Uh, this is not a problem we've solved. 
I uh, have a board meeting in uh, a week and a half, and this is a part of the conversation we're going to be having, is what about our regional strategy and how does collective impact fit into it? Um, and so um, maybe next year I can talk about our progress on that, that particular issue. But, um, but we are wrestling with it. Yeah. And uh, Mary Jean, um, we'd love to hear about this from your perspective as a backbone leader. Obviously, you know, backbone are often trying to weave together many different sources of funding, both public and private. And um, the roadmap, problem, uh, roadmap project, if folks aren't aware, is the recipient of a $40 million Race to the Top grant, among other sources of funding. Um, or at least it is in parallel and aligned with the roadmap project. Can you speak a little bit about how you see sustainability um, from the backbone perspective? Um, well, consistent with what's been said, um, but I think, I mean, there's, there's the, the overall initiative and the backbone, which I feel like you have to, sh it, there's a value proposition. I mean, you have, to, um, you have to be making some headway. People have to believe that you've got a pr the promise of, of success um, or they're not gonna you know, stick with it. Um, I do think as you're, as you're um, doing work, you're watching for these opportunities to institutionalize better practices. Mm -hmm. So I think of a thing we worked on um, across our region was getting, uh, there's a really great college scholarship that Washington State offers. And when we started our project, we had very low sign-up rates um, for, by the eligible families. and so. We worked on that, and over a few years, we got to high, um, you know, into the high 90s. So now, year after year, um, the school districts largely have um, uh, adopted the practices to get the kids signed up for the scholarship. So one of the superintendents said to me a couple of years ago, because I was still badgering them on a regular basis about this, and he said, "You can stop uh, badgering us about this. We've got this one now." So um, a lot of times when I look at, at school districts, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, um, they're good at, at, once something becomes a routine, then they're good at maintaining it. I mean, that's a problem too, right? Because they've got a lot of routines that we don't like. <laughs> um, but if you can get them to start some new routines that you do like, they're pretty darn good at doing those year after year. So I do think that's part of um, the sustainability uh, mindset or um, you know uh, playbook, um, better use of data, um, better partnering with um, community uh, youth serving organizations, um, uh, community colleges, you know taking on better practices for their new high school grads, the high schools better connecting with higher ed. I mean all those kinds of things we're working on, um, and I, I can see um, evidence of. Um, that sort of system change. Um, uh, we have a great um, evaluator team from Ed Northwest. They're based in Portland. Um, the Gates Foundation has funded a formative evaluation of the Roadmap Project. We have some um, copies here. Julie is here. Um, uh, and one of the weaknesses, I think, of our effort has been we didn't document well enough or um, we weren't explicit uh, enough about the system change um, uh, evidence of system change as we as we've gone along. So again, in the next phase, we're trying to really not just not just look at our endpoint um, summative results, but um, make ourselves more um, clear about what we um, these system changes that we expect to see, and um, and then track that um, because I think that's the kind of stuff that um, will you know be the, kind of the lasting legacy. Yeah, no, I love that idea, Mary Jean, not just of thinking about the sustainability for the backbone, right, the weaving of public and private funding, but actually how you can fundamentally change the way that public dollars are used and leveraged to ultimately get to the impact that you're trying to get to in the broader effort, right? The College Bound Scholarship is an amazing example um, that Mary Jean just referenced where literally if you're in the eighth grade and you're low income in Washington State, you're eligible to sign up for the College Bound Scholarship, and if you graduate from high school, you have a full ride to college. So now, thanks to the efforts of the Roadmap and its partners, 98% of all eighth graders are signed up for the College Bound Scholarship, and this is thousands of youth that now have access to a full ride to college, right? So it's, it's a wonderful example of really changing behavior in the system where it was no one's job 
it was no one's job to sign those youth up for college-bound scholarships, but now it is, and it's really shifted, yeah. A lot of the things that, and Faye and I have talked about this over the years, a lot of things that we have taken on, if you reflect on it, in a system, um, they were tasks, really important tasks, but they were nobody's job in our, um, in our area. Um, and, and just one thing on the college bound, um, we have a lot more work to do to change the way um, that we're working more in partnership with our um, community and our families. And um, one of the things on college bound, so we've, we've had this great success, so now all the low income families that have this um, great college scholarship, but we've gone back now and we're doing these focus groups and discussions with the families and they don't understand what they have. So it was kind of an example of um, a technical solution and they have, they, they sign the right pieces of paper, but they are largely families that, where the parents didn't go to college, um, many are non-native English speakers, the jargon of higher ed doesn't make any sense to them. Um, and our state um, doesn't have the resources to do a good job of communicating with them. So a next phase for us is to revolutionize and design with the families a communication strategy so they understand what they have and the parents can then help the kids navigate um, through the college um, going process. So um, I'm really excited about you know, the next phase of our work. But. I, I, would, I would argue that we're not a mature or, um, initiative. <laughs> I think um, FSG should write a new paper and put those time <laughs> scales out a little bit. Love it, yes, on the task, Mary Jean. All right. um, so we're gonna stop at this point. Uh, I know that we've had a lot of topics that we've touched on, and these are some of the trickiest, I would say, um, in this work. We're gonna turn it back to you all now in terms of your tables and table discussion. Um, I'm gonna put a slide up here in terms of uh, questions to address. But what we'd like you to do is just take a minute to think yourself about some of the conversation we've been having up here um, uh, on stage um, and some of the, um, the reflections that you have on your own work. So as you think about some of these issues that we've touched on, you know, issues of power and control, issues of accountability, issues of sustainability in this work, um, what resonates with you in terms of the own, your own work that you're doing? What might be a little bit different um, that you heard up here from what you're doing now? Um, and then really specifically, what might you do differently um, as you go back to your own communities based on what you're learning from this conversation and, and from the time at the conference? So we'll take about just a minute to reflect individually and then turn to your neighbor or your full table, whatever you'd prefer, and we'll have about just 10 minutes of dialogue and we'll come back and then have an opportunity for, for Q&A and discussion with the panel, okay? So just take about 10 minutes to talk amongst yourselves in the tables. All right, we're gonna um, have everyone come back together for a group discussion now. I'm delighted to hear you guys are having such great conversations at your tables. Um, dying to hear what you have to say about uh, what this means for your own work. And I think we have some runners with mics um, in the back. Yes, over here in the back. Does anybody, oh, you guys are having such good conversations. I love it. Does anybody want to share back um, from their conversations uh, with the group, either reflections or questions that you have for our fabulous panelists? There's some mics over here. Who'd like to share back from your from your great conversations, or perhaps ask questions. I'm gonna call on somebody. <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. Who's got, a, who's got a reflection or a question? Yes, over here, right here in the middle. Hi. Is there any momentum of using augmented reality or virtual reality in theme-based interactive play, placemaking to collect data so such that movement or decisions are based on a person's time and place or observation versus always prompting a question and data collection and surveys and also using the, the phone apps to use capturing sentiment. Is there anything that you've noticed through your work that has, resonates with this kind of ideas? Hmm. Any of not, that, not that I know of. Um, no, not at, not at this point. I do know that in some other work that I'm doing with the tribal college, they're actually using, um, they've ordered a slew of um, iPads 
and they no longer do paper surveys or emails. They literally stand there and wait for students to do the surveys and they have like a 95% response rate. And so I do know that across the country, people are trying different things. In our community, that's not something that I've investigated, but we have really innovative superintendents who know I may go back and ask <laughs> if anyone is doing anything like that. Yeah. Mary Jean, do you want to just mention the phone survey you all did in the early stages of the roadmap? That might be relevant. Or well, I, I mean, I don't, it's not I'm no expert yeah. on augmented reality. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just, re I yeah. literally just read and heard a great piece on NPR about augmented reality and it was mind blowing. And so I would actually love to talk to you after this session. <laughs> um, and I, I think we're just, in Seattle, in this area with the technology that is here, I think it could be, um, uh, we could just be doing so much more uh, yeah. with um, those kind of cutting edge technologies that we're not doing right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, there, I agree. There's a huge opportunity there. And just a shout out for the Fund for Shared Insight. I know um, there are folks there from, from that group uh, in the audience, and they did a panel yesterday as well. But there's a lot of really interesting work that's going on now around using um, uh, technology to get input from residents um, and essentially customers, right, in the community, um, using things like Net Promoter Score, and those are things you can do through iPads and mobile phones and those kinds of things. So really interesting work that's going on there. Other questions? I know I saw a hand back over here. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Gloris, and I work at Philanthropy Northwest. Thank you all. I've learned so much. Um, one reflection and a question I had is you all talk about systems change and um, battling the status quo. How have you changed any practices or operations in your own organizations, both funders and uh, backbone organizations, to work more authentically with communities and um, engage in different ways um, than prior to your collective impact um, projects? So the one-on-one -on -one meeting that Lucelna mentioned that she participated in 2012, um, we did five or six others of those meetings in the Rio Grande Valley with superintendents, the higher ed leaders, and a community leader or two. And that's probably the biggest change for us is we, we, uh, we asked permission to come into the Rio Grande Valley, again, because we don't live there. And, and I would say even if you live in the city limits, if you're driving across town, to a different neighborhood, you're probably a guest there too. It's one of those mindset shifts. Um, but I think asking permission to, to come in and, and bring this new idea, a different way of doing things, would be one change of practice. I think from a, from a uh, regional standpoint, uh, Lucella mentioned House Bill 5 earlier. It essentially overhauled the, the uh, high school graduation standards for uh, Texas high schools, 1.4 million high school students. Um, and um, it required a lot of things. Among them was a college readiness course in math and English language arts for students who were not college ready at the end of the 11th grade. Uh, the statute didn't design, define what com, uh, successfully completes means. It didn't define who a higher ed partner was. It, it didn't uh, mandate that the courses would be portable. And so uh, this came up in a, a late spring leadership meeting uh, had to be implemented by the following fall. Um, and the decision makers in the room said, we're gonna have one course, and we have 1,600 high schools, 1,200 school districts. Uh, we could have had 1,200 courses developed times two. Um, but the leaders in the room said, we're going to uh, have one course in English language arts, one course in mathematics. It will be offered by every high school. It will be accepted by every higher ed institution, fully portable across the region. It's the only region in the state that did it that way. And now it's, it's uh, it's now fully portable between the, the next region up, uh, region one and region two of Texas. And so, you know, again, having the, the decision makers at the table who in, in one three hour meeting decided to proceed that way, um, a, a change of course that you couldn't predict in terms of state law, um, and you can immediately react and adapt and develop a course and have it piloted by, by that September when, court, when school started. So I mean, think, you know, how you can think about what you can do when you have the right leaders in the room um, again, the decision makers making uh, out of trust, uh, and they, when they signed the MOU months later, you know, but, they, but in the room that day they committed to it, the higher ed faculty, the high school faculty worked together with no compensation, developed these two courses, uh, and it's, it's changed the way they think about developmental education and the way that they're doing other things because of, of that work. Yeah, I think I want to add that um, 
One way is that we as a backbone have changed in Educate Texas overall is that we no longer make assumptions that we know. You know, what, what is in the best interest of our community. An example for us is we pulled together the five directors of financial aid in response to La Unión del Pueblo Intero that works with, an, with our undocumented students. And they said to us, you know, even though Texas has money for these students, these five higher eds have five different applications and processes. And because our students, I don't know if you know about Texas, but we have a border checkpoint, right? That's about 100 miles north. And so our, our students, our undocumented students, can't go beyond the Rio Grande Valley. So we had to solve this issue. And in three months, we had one application, we had a toolkit for counselors, and one process uh, for, to serve these students. It has now become a routine a working group of the action group where these folks are meeting routinely. We now have everything from a resource guide from access to, to completion for them. But the really, I think, thing that we decided was in talking to the counselors is that it's not just acceptable that we put out something for the counselors. And so we worked with focus groups with our community, with our school district partners and our parental engagement folks and pulled focus groups of parents and said, what are your fears? What do you need to know in order to allow your students to fill out these applications, right? And at the fifth grade in Spanish, we've developed a bifold, right, for parents answering questions. They don't need forms. There's professionals to do that. What they needed was assurance that they weren't going to be deported, that the information wasn't going. So we, have, we no longer make assumptions. We literally are saying, take us to those who can answer the questions of what they really need. And so for us, I think that's the biggest way that we have changed, is that we've thrown away the idea that we know what's in the best interest of everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. David Just a couple of other yeah. responses to the question. It, in our team, it ranges from once, uh, once, first of all, we had to figure out the unit of change. For example, we've never thought of the region, a metropolitan region, as what we're aiming at, as opposed to state level change or school mm -hmm. or school district change. That's not a small shift. Uh, especially because it didn't exist before Mary Jean came along. Two is things like when they set goals in the roadmap, we've adopted those as our goals for our participation in the roadmap. So there's no distance between what I'm telling my boss looks like success versus what Mary Jean and the community see as success, which is different. Um, other issues are what is the importance of capacity? So. We've made a pretty big bet on building the backbone, and we've built, and we are increasingly making bigger bets on some of the community organizations so they can participate more fully. Those things don't pay off in terms of a student impact very quickly. So the, the success there is stronger organizations, stronger leadership, which is a different way of looking at philanthropy as well. So I could keep going. Uh, a different one I will mention is the issue that confronts you on inequity correlating to race and income. It's forced our team to actually spend time internally getting clearer how we view that issue, what our values are and what the implications are for how we behave and do our work. And we've also then engaged with people outside the foundation on the same set of questions. So these are all things that I think were largely, not exclusively, but largely prompted by our experience in the roadmap. Great. Um, we have time for one more question, maybe up here in the front, on the side of the room. We talked a little bit about language, the, the word systems, what does it mean to people. I'm just curious, um, do you all have any experience with having to clarify language over and over again, or um, <laughs> what, and what, what advice do you have regarding the use of languages? Uh, nouns are so, once they're set in somebody's head as to what a noun is, it's yeah. Uh, it's yeah. so difficult to get beyond that. So I'm just curious if you have any reflections so on that. I'll give you a really a good question. example. Uh, <laughs> when I was, hi I was hired a year into the work, right, and they were in the middle of the Data Support Council deciding on what our, ni our outcomes would be. And I'm sitting at the table, and I f it finally dawned on me that this, because the presidents kept saying to me, ah, oh, these superintendents, you know, they just, you know, don't care about, they don't want the data to come out on ninth grade persistence, right? And retention and, 
this, this, and I finally said, how do you define retention, right? <laughs> they said to me, we had completely different ideas on retention, right? Mm -hmm. And so where the presidents wanted to increase retention, the superintendents are like, are you crazy? We've got to get them in and through. And so we realized that language matters. And so de operationally defining what we're talking about. And so one thing that we've done to kind of try and and, and uh, alleviate some of that is we rotate our meetings. All of our leadership team meetings are hosted by one of our members. And we give them 15 minutes to shine a light on something at their institution. Um, we also then also begin to be, you know, at the beginning we were bringing pe people from the data support council or from the action groups and saying, please define what ninth grade persistence is. And also figuring out that even though the state might have a common practice, or policy, everybody operationalizes it different. So the fact that one school district, for example, had a 30% ninth grade persistence didn't mean that they were worse than the one that had a 10%. And it may just be that the 30% guys have a tougher promotion policy, right? And so getting them to understand that, I, I can't emphasize how much language matters in narrative and definitions, especially when you're talking about cross sectors. Now imagine community-based organization, like what are you people even talking about, right? And so you do have to operationally define things, create a common language, and understand each other. Because sometimes you can't change the way the language is in the respective organizations, but we all have to understand each other's language, if not, if you can't create a common language. And make it okay for someone to ask, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Exactly, yeah. No, I think this is, this is actually a really important issue and one that always comes up in collective impact simply by nature of the fact that you've got different sectors at the table mm -hmm. and community members. And so they're naturally speaking different languages, right? And so taking the time up front to be clear about what are we talking about and what do we mean by these terms? I know some collective impact efforts have even gone so far as to come up with a glossary of terms that they literally share with their partners. So this is what we mean by retention, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a really great question. So I, I would love to maybe just finish by um, giving our panelists an opportunity to provide any parting advice that they'd like to um, in sort of what it, <laughs> <laughs> what, what it feels like to do this work and, and maybe sort of what they've learned. Um, do you guys have any advice you'd like to share with, with the group? I, I, I mean, I don't know if it's advice. I just was, I was thinking about the relationship um, the, of, with the funders and with your, you know, your primary funders. And I came to, I was thinking the analogy of um, just being in, a, in the boat, being in a boat together and being in a really, you know, rough sea. And that, that um, to me is, and you're going, you know, you're trying to go on to a destination and you're gonna experience a lot of turmoil and, um, and then hopefully some smooth sailing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the difference between um, that and feeling like you're on a journey by yourself and maybe somebody sends you a little bit of fuel or something, um, uh, but it's just a totally different relationship that you're, you know you're in it together, you're very committed to the destination. Um, and if you can get that and, and have that work, um, again, no guarantee, but then I think you up the chances of success. Thank you, Angie. Yeah. For, the, for the funders, uh, I'd encourage us to think about risk and failure differently. Um, we talk about a risky grant um, and, I've, and a, a grant that failed. And I've been in conversations over the last couple of three months at different meetings about these terms that we use, going back to you know, what, what do words mean. And um, so the, the risk of as opposed to what? Uh, continuing to invest in programs for 30 or 40 students or in, in systems that don't work for most students. Um, so the, the, the risk of what as opposed to what? And when a grant fails, um, we don't fail, you know, in our case, students are the ones that are failing. And so really thinking about um, how, we, how we think about the language that we, talk, we use to describe our grants and how we assess progress and, and thinking what is the role of failure and what is the role of learning um, and how do we do things that um, where you mitigate the risk of failure uh, because again, in, in there are real human lives involved in this work and so um, not continuing to fail people who, who have been failed, uh, uh, the systems have failed too often. Okay, thank you.
I think for, for me, it would be um, that, you know, unlike traditional grants um, and, and projects, I don't see this as a project or as an initiative. I, you know, I always say that I see this as life's work, right? Uh, because if you do, if you are in this, you really can plan 12 to 18 months in advance, but you need to be ready to, to shift almost on a dime and to be able to bring the funder with you and to be the thought partner and say, we thought we were moving in this direction. For example, for us, we were not even gonna touch teaching excellence, but when we got the new dean of the College of Education and she was coming in with these, in how many of you can ever say that you're, that you're invited by a dean of College of Education and where she's opening herself up and we said, okay, we're moving. We're moving and this is what we're going to do and be able to shift our priorities because sometimes the opportunity is too great to move and being able to have the trust to say to your funder and to your leadership team, we're shifting and this is why. And for them to trust that you know what you're doing is, is an awesome responsibility. But I think for me, that's the, 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 the biggest, not advice, but the biggest kind of just knowledge that, that, that we can impart is that, you know, the fear of interacting, but like people will say, how do you work with your funder? Well, they're just human like we are, right? And so it really is, it has to be that honest. And I routinely talk to when even outside of our leadership team meetings about, oh, and this is shifting and this is happening and has he thought about this? And he's always connecting me to the Austin folks or the Dallas folks and pushing me to make those cross community connections. And so it's about truly meaning it when you have this relationship and leveraging it for, for when you need to rethink something. Thank you, Rosanna. David. And I leave here with a couple of thoughts. One is I think we should all go visit the Rio Grande Valley and see this in action <laughs> when it's not so hot. <laughs> so if it's not too hot, come between December and January. <laughs> Great mile up from Texas, yeah. won't you? <laughs> and then the other one, I just would reinforce part of what I started with, which this is an approach that is not appropriate for every problem. Mm -hmm. And further, it's not appropriate for the faint of heart that is, you do feel like you're swimming in open seas and no coastline anywhere to be seen. <laughs> um, and um, it's all that much more important that in the face of that ambiguity and unknown is you actually have to be really, really clear at every moment what you think you're doing, why you're doing it, how you would know it is working. But the deep listening and observation to be uh, not too prideful, that is to, be, to admit the mistakes, mm -hmm and most importantly to learn from them and get better and better and better and better. Because we're not gonna solve any of the problems we care about, uh, probably in my career at least. <laughs> maybe some of you are younger than me. <laughs> Thank you, David. And, and maybe just to sort of to follow on to that point, I think what we've been talking about today is that this work is a paradigm shift, right? In terms of how change happens. And it requires us to rethink, fundamentally rethink so many of the questions that we've been talking about today. Who has power? Who has control? How do you create the room to shift some of those traditional power dynamics? How do you actually create sustainability for long-term change that takes decades? How do you redefine risk, right? So I think that these are the questions that all of us need to be wrestling with, and I would just like to thank our incredible panelists for the discussion this morning and for their leadership in the work in the field. So thank you guys. <laughs>